Thank you all for joining us for this webinar, or kind of today by um, ESD Networks. Joined by Mark Madigan. So Mark is a, a senior safety and health manager for ESD Networks. Um, and then we have Arthur Byrne. Uh, so Arthur Byrne is the public safety manager with ESD Networks. Um, and the purpose of today's webinar is for ESP networks to outline the updated code of practice for avoiding danger from overhead electricity lines. Uh, and this came into effect as of May of this year. Okay, uh, thank you, John. And uh, thank you to the CIF for facilitating this uh, webinar. Um, ESP networks um, own and operate the transmission and distribution network across uh, the Republic of Ireland. Um, we have overhead network in all of uh, the counties across the Republic and inc including some of the islands uh, off the coasts as well. So everywhere across the Republic um, you will come in contact with um, or be in the vicinity of overhead lines. So this, the, the, the webinar here today associated with the overhead code of practice is a hugely important document. Uh, it's hugely important in terms of um, keeping people safe um, from the, the, the hazard of electricity and also protecting the network which, which ultimately protects uh, continuity of supply to the, the 2.3 million customers that ESB Networks has, be they domestic uh, properties or our um, commercial uh, customers. So look, um, with that, um, we'll, we'll jump straight into the presentation. Um, so look, we're gonna just talk and touch on the significance of the code of practice in terms of why we developed it, why we updated it, um, where it applies, where it doesn't apply, uh, and a number of areas like. So look, as I said a second ago, ESB Networks owns and operates the transmission and distribution network, um, the electricity network across the Republic, and that is under license from the Commission for the Regulation of Utilities. Um, we sort of have various uh, requirements placed on us under that license, one of which is around public safety. Um, but on top of that, we also have um, sort of safety legislation that applies equally um, to all organizations. ESB as an employer is absolutely included in there. So we have sort of statutory responsibilities that um, we have to meet in terms of, you know, our own construction um, and our own employees and our own contractors, but also how that relates then to third parties or members of the public who could be affected by our activities or our um, um, network. Um, so we have very specific requirements set down under legislation. As I said, we also have um, under license from the CRU um, requirements placed on us in terms of doing everything that's reasonably practical to protect people from injury um, from the electricity network. That doesn't just apply to overhead network, that also applies to the underground network. Um, but obviously for today's focus, we're just going to be touching and keeping um, talking about the overhead network. Um, <clears throat> look. Why is this important? Um, ultimately, it's important because electricity is, is a hazardous substance. We've had 23 fatalities involving um, construction work and electricity since 1994. Um, and that obviously is 23 families affected by that, that unfortunate scenario or situation involving the fatality. That's 23 um, times that people have had bad news. That's also 23 um, times they know that, that people have been adversely affected by um, the incident. Um, so that is something that we are actively and hugely committed to trying to prevent any type of injury um, or indeed near miss involving the electricity network. But look, there's, there's many other, other uh, incidents involving the, the electricity network other than just fatalities. Um, everything from minor burns through to the more significant serious burns um, that, that people get when they get too close um, to, to the network. As you can see there, um, construction industry applies, uh, accounts for 41% of, of the incidents there, but there's also another uh, nearly 60% of other types of incidents involving uh, the electricity network. So it's a huge area that ESB and ESB networks in particular puts a lot of time and energy and resources into trying to uh, educate um, and also trying to prevent then people from coming in contact with or near contact with the overhead network. So that's just some of the reasons why this code of practice is important. Some typical examples here of what we encounter, um, not quite on a daily basis, but certainly maybe on a weekly basis. You know, you can see there at the scaffolding, um, that's just 
people not taking into account the risks associated with 20,000 uh, volt network directly overhead. And as we know, you know storing scaffolding particularly um, is a very conductive material and that was a recipe for disaster. And unfortunately, in that case, two people who were seriously injured. They did make a full recovery, but they did still receive fairly significant injuries as a result of coming in contact with uh, the live overhead network. In the center there, you also see, um, again, scaffolding on a sort of a, a domestic type um, property. And that is one um, in recent uh, months we have seen on the increase. Um, you know, small builders um, building scaffolding too close to or not taking account of the overhead line and, and putting the scaffolding into the proximity zones. And we'll touch on, we'll touch on the zones contained within the code of practice later. But that's again is just another example and then obviously the third picture again is where a tower crane just they didn't take into account the 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 live overhead network when uh, they were doing their lift plans uh, the crane wasn't fitted with any limiters or any um, preventative devices from the, the operator slewing into the network and and he did end up uh, the driver did end up slewing into the network bringing down the, the cables on a, on a truck that happened to be passing by no fault of the truck passing by just just bad timing um, but again whilst there was no injuries in that case the uh, the incident could have been a lot more serious had it been um, a different outcome so again the, the risks are very real um, the incidents unfortunately are too common and again that's why as I say we put a lot of time and effort and energy into the code of practice just to talk about the old code of practice now at this stage was first published in 2008 um, it, that code of practice had served the country very well in terms of um, it helping to prevent incidents and accidents. It also provided very significant guidance, particularly to the construction industry, around the do's and don'ts associated with working uh, in the vicinity of overhead network. Um, but, but in 2017 and into 2018, 18, we undertook, um, in conjunction with the Health and Safety Authority, a full review of that code of practice. Time had moved on, uh, safe digging or safe construction practices had moved on, legislation had moved on. So there were a number of elements associated with improvements in the industry that we had to in implement and incorporate into the, the code of practice to keep the new code of practice relevant and also to ensure that um, it, it was effective out of, um, in the field in terms of being used on site and it making sense on site. So look, some of the some of the, the changes. Obviously, as we know, it's a revised, it's an approved code of practice from the Health and Safety Authority. Um, it was a joint initiative between ourselves and the Health and Safety Authority around working together to update and ensure the code of practice was as fit for purpose as it could be. Obviously, it involved extensive public consultation when it got to the, the stage where that was the appropriate time um, to do. So we put the the code of practice, the, the draft code of practice out via the Health and Safety Authority website and also via the ESP Networks website. And we sort of um, um, sort of asked for, for comments and we asked for it to be critiqued and reviewed and um, uh, really sort of digested in terms of making sure that we took into account all of the different scenarios as, as far as we could foresee to make sure the code of practice was the best code of practice it could be. That, that extensive public consultation threw up quite a number of comments, each of, each of which um, we went through. Um, we had over 150 com separate comments that came in, and we addressed each one of them individually. Some of them we incorporated into the document, some of them we didn't incorporate it into the document, and where we couldn't incorporate the comment, we went back to the person who left the comment um, or comments with us, and we explained the rationale for why we were not including their particular uh, query or comment in, in the revised document. And there were various reasons for that. But ultimately, um, everybody that, that made a submission where the submission wasn't successful, we sort of went back to that person and, and engaged with them, just sort of to close that loop. Um, obviously, the code of practice, look, it takes account of changes in legislation, as I said earlier on, particularly as that relates to the client and designer responsibilities brought in for the first time in um, private dwellings, um, came in underneath the remit of the code of practice. That's one that, that we spent a bit of time on. It also clarifies safety zones. So again, your, 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 the different zones around the overhead network 
and it made it very, very easy for people to interpret what the requirements are in terms of, um, you know, being in one zone or a second zone and how you, what controls you implement around them. And it, an interesting area that we hadn't challenged, that we hadn't faced in 2008 was around um, the cost reduction directive. The cost reduction directive is an EU uh, legislation that came in around um, reducing down the cost of providing broadband across the country. That was an EU directive that uh, was transposed into Irish law back in 2016. And again, it, it placed very specific requirements on the, um, the overhead network operator in that it allowed third parties to, sl to sling uh, um, telecommunications cables using our infrastructure. Um, obviously, that had a very significant impact or continues to have a very significant impact on ESB networks in that it allows people to get closer to uh, our network than had ever been allowed heretofore. So we've done a huge amount of work with the people that are approved to do that work. But again, we had to build that into the, the contents of the code of practice in that it was a now a foreseeable risk. They have that requirement under legislation, so we had to take that into account. Lastly, um, we, 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 we did a huge amount of work with um, NALA, the National Adult Literacy Agency. The figures that NALA talked to us about was that one in five people um, across the country have problems with reading and writing. Now, one in, I wouldn't have thought it was that high, but, but uh, NALA really were very strong with us that yes, that, that is the, 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 the volume of people that have difficulties with reading and writing. So we put a huge amount of time and effort and energy into making the code of practice as easily understood by all as is possible. So no longer do you have to be a safety officer or a safety representative or, or a, a project engineer or a site engineer. The code of practice is written in, in a way that anybody can pick it up and un understand what needs to be implemented in the different chapters associated um, with whatever the, the work that you want to do is. And that was something that we, we were very, very strong on as part of our public safety remit. The, the code of practice should not just be a code of practice that a small cohort of people can read and understand. It needed to be understood by all, which obviously increased the, the chances that it would be used by a vast, a much more vast um, cohort of people across the country. So again, we were delighted when NALA awarded it the plain English accreditation, and that's the little mark down on the bottom right-hand corner of the code of practice as you look at it. So again, that's, that's just something that we are trying to implement right across all of our public safety uh, messaging so that uh, anybody can pick up the, 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 the booklet or leaflet or code of practice and understand what's contained within it. Just before I hand over Arthur, who uh, is our public safety manager and who is out there on a daily basis um, sort of talking about uh, public safety engagements and public safety interaction and keeping publics, the public in general safe, I just want to just touch on quickly uh, the 12 chapters contained within the code of practice. Look, it, it includes everything from building sites, roads and roadworks. It's applicable on construction sites related to farms. We know there's a huge amount of work going on in farms, which um, have a lot of overhead network by, their, by the design. Farms um, don't have a huge amount of underground, so it's, it's, there is that element. Because as I mentioned a minute ago, there's the telecommunications aspect. Telecommunications companies have the right now to come in and make representations to ESP networks to use our infrastructure to sling telecommunications network. And again, we, we have to manage that space. And obviously then the, the one that crops up every now and then is the transport, transporting high loads, which again, is just another foreseeable risk associated with, particularly with the construction industry, but with lots of other industries as well. We also put a bit of time into making sure that it was very clear who was not uh, included in the general scope of the code of practice. And look, by and large, that's just the, the agriculture industry, forestry, hedge cutting, there's, there's separate, HSA approved codes of practice associated with those sectors. But also we wanted to be clear <clears throat> about whether the code of practice applied to ESB network staff and our approved contractors. So again, um, we're, we're clear we have very strict uh, rules and regulations um, within ESB and ESB networks in particular around how we document and how we implement safe systems of work, approvals, all that kind of stuff. So we, we were clear in, in the scope of the document that it did not or does not apply to ESB networks staff and obviously ESB networks approved contractors who, who are ultimately are approved to work on the overhead network. Um, 
With that, I'm just going to hand over to Arthur, the Public Safety Manager, um, and Arthur will bring us through some of the, the um, detail contained within the Code of Practice. Okay, so thanks, thanks, Mark, and thanks, John, and I hope everybody that's watching in and listening in is, is, is getting value from the presentation. So what I, what I am going to cover is a little bit of the detail of the Code of Practice, and I suppose the first thing I'd say is I encourage you to download the Code of Practice and, and to become familiar with the document. Uh, obviously, what we're doing here is just going through the kind of the high level important bits, but I suppose the fundamentally important bit uh, is that really from a health and safety point of view, given the risk that electricity presents, is that you have to keep a safe distance from live electricity wires, which are always live, irrespective of whether they seem live or not. So, the, so there's two zones and like it's very common sense and very simple, although I accept in practice that it's, it's difficult to, uh, to ensure that you're uh, eliminating the possibility of reaching these zones when you're carrying out, if you like, the very complex work that can often go ahead on existing buildings and with the construction of new buildings using very tall machinery uh, in close proximity to live overhead electricity networks, whether they're the low voltage networks on the side of the street or whether they're the 400,000 volt lines that cross the country uh, from, from west to east. So the first zone is what we call the hazard zone. And um, like the hazard zone, as, as you can see there in the picture, it's essentially a ground up looking, you look at the zone and you see the overhead wires and <coughs> you just define an area that you don't encroach upon. So it's really a pass by zone or a drive by zone. Uh, and it's dependent, it's determined by the voltage. So the higher the voltage, the further away you have to, you have to keep. And the reason for that is electricity, like obviously if you contact electricity, as Mark has just said, people who had near misses apart from the people who were killed, um, or people who might, might necessarily have touched electricity wires, but electricity can jump gaps, uh, and therefore you don't have to make direct contact to be a serious risk of electrocution and ultimately of death. So that's why the safety zone called the hazard zone is so important. And as I said, it's, it's determined by the voltage. And there's only really two numbers. There's a six meter number and a 10 meter number. And the six meter number applies for voltages up to 38,000 volts. And then the 10 meter number applies from voltages of 110,000, 220,000 and 400,000. And I know the first thing you probably say, well, how do I know? And we don't expect anybody other than ESP networks people to know that. And that's why I'll talk a little bit later about how you find out that. And if you like, in terms of the zone working for you to keep you safe, you absolutely have to know the voltage. And the only absolute clear way you can know the voltage is to contact ESP networks directly. And we'll furnish the information uh, via maps uh, either on request or in a more systematic way, if that's your prefer preference. Uh, so that's, I suppose, a key message around the zone. So don't think you know the voltage, even though with respect you may well do. Uh, only rely on the information that's provided by ESV. So, so that hazard zone uh, means what it says, I suppose, it is, is an area where if you're inside that, you're at, you're at risk and there's a hazard presented from, from the fact of the presence of electricity wires. Um, and it says it minimizes the risk of accident contact and obviously, if you stay outside the hazard zone from an ESP networks and electricity risk point of view, there is no material risk once you stay outside that zone and maintain a system that ensures that you stay outside that zone and that you don't accidentally go in or you don't accidentally encroach with something that you're holding on to, whether that's a scaffolding bar. And that's why, for example, we always say you carry scaffolding bars horizontally or make sure they're being transported horizontally. And if they are being transported in that way, then you make sure you don't encroach on the hazard zone. So the, I suppose the next zone, and there's only two of them, and the exclusion zone is, you know, and I've used this term in other, in other presentations, it's the absolute no-go zone in terms of your own safety, your personal safety, the safety of colleagues, and indeed, if you like, the safety and integrity of equipment. And if you were to go in there, pulling down the line, as you saw from Mark's presentation earlier, with the equipment falling on the line, not only are you putting yourself at risk, but you're under risk of putting others at risk. Uh, so the exclusion zone is the absolute no-go zone. And that's, again, determined by the voltage. Uh, and it's a smaller number, obviously, than the hazard zone. And to all intents and purposes, for most of the voltages, I'll simplify it and say it's three meters. So whatever you're doing, wherever you are carrying out work, you absolutely have to be certain and sure you can never encroach upon three meters within a low voltage fair line a line that's 10,000 volts or 20,000 volts or indeed 38,000 volts. And they are the predominant voltages that you encounter, if you like, out in the countryside, uh, close to towns and villages 
where it's not undergrounded. And then you're probably more familiar then with the higher voltage lines, which are typically on twin poles or big towers or masts. Uh, so you know visually the difference there. So for most people, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the three meters is the, very, is the very relevant number. And, and the reason that's so, so important is, firstly, it's very difficult to measure distance when you're looking up at it or indeed looking down at it or, or you're in a tower crane or you're trying to control something that's been, if you like, controlled by somebody else to, to judge distance. And that's why uh, that three meters is absolutely critical. And I suppose the purpose of the hazard zone is to, to recognize that if I'm outside the hazard zone, I have no possibility of, in, of encroaching on the exclusion zone. If, as I'll talk a little bit later, where the practical requirements of the work dictate that you have to be inside the hazard zone in some shape, way, or form, so then you have to be certain and clear that you're more rigorous controls are ensuring that you don't fall into the exclusion zone in recognition of the fact that electricity can jump the gap so you don't have to make direct contact and in recognition of the fact that, as I said earlier, it can be, it can be difficult to judge, if you like, visual spatial dimensions when you're looking up and whether that's being blinded by the sunlight or whether it's just the height of where you are relative to where you're looking at. Uh, so they're, they're the two zones. And I'm going to talk a little bit now, I suppose, about the practical scenarios that arise. And there are three such scenarios uh, and just before I say that, I suppose, as, as I emphasized at the start of that slide in particular, and to re-emphasize it again, is, is to contact ESB Network so that you, you're, you're clear about what the voltage is uh, and what level of voltage is. And that in turn determines the hazard zone, which is six or 10 meters. And lots of people work on the basis of the 10 meters. And then you're sure about the exclusion zone, that your, your controls are going to be sufficient and adequate to, to make sure you never breach that zone. So, and I suppose in saying what Mark has said earlier, like we are encouraging everybody involved in construction work near electricity networks to always contact ESB networks. Uh, in some cases, you may consider that uh, unnecessary in light of the information you get other than the voltage information, but for many, many other cases, the conversation and the information that would be transacted between the two uh, can meet, make the difference between a safe situation or possibly an unsafe situation. So more sites, uh, can be categorized into these three categories and th these are quite simple visual uh, examples and I'm going to just go through each of them individually very quickly. So essentially you have sites where you're not going to be working or any machinery or plant passing on the uh, inside the hazard zone. And remember if you think about the most, most common voltages up to 38,000 volts, that hazard zone is six meters. So if you imagine you know, electricity, three wires, uh, pole. So you, you measure out six meters from the outer conductor to the left and you measure out six meters from the uh, outer conductor to the right. And if you like that, that area then is, is, is the hatched area. It's like the yellow box on a road that you don't enter into. Uh, that's the hazard zone. Uh, so if, 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 if one situation you're not carrying out any work or you're not passing on the electricity lines within that hazard zone, that's one scenario. And obviously that's of the three, that's the safest possible situation. You're not really at any risk of electricity. Uh, you might be at risk of other things, but certainly not of electricity. And then moving on from that then, where you're still not carrying out any work inside the hazard zone, but you have to pass underneath the electricity wires to get from one part of the site to the other part of the site, whether that's involved in clearing the site at the early stages or so at some other stage. And often the risks that we encounter arise at those early stages when people say, well, I'm, only, I'm actually only clearing the site and defining the site and maybe fencing the site. Sometimes that's one of the most hazardous times because you know, while the PSDP and the designer should have all that in, uh, covered in their design risk assessment, sometimes that, that hasn't always been the case. And then if you like the, 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 the third scenario, which is if you like the most serious scenario, where for no other reason than the work has to go ahead, you have to be closer to the network than the hazard, you're inside the hazard zone, obviously never inside the exclusion zone, but you're somewhere between three and six meters away from the overhead electricity lines if it's the typical overhead line or further if it's, it's the higher voltage lines. And I just covered those three uh, very quickly now. So in the first case, so in the first case, you're, you're not carrying out any work in the hazard zone. And as I said, it's just, you're just passing by. So you're, you're visually and physically barrowing off uh, the overhead line in terms of your, if you're like your work or your transport or your transit around the site. So it just, as it says there, you, you put up physical markers and barriers at a low level that prevents, if you like, uh, somebody wandering in, whether that's losing control of a machine or just not thinking. And then you have the bunting, which is obviously higher up. And it just makes it more visual from a distance. Uh, and if you like, the lower level barriers obviously keep it safe when you're sort of up close and personal to the hazard zone. And it's just a matter of, you're very familiar with it, all of this, I'm sure, 
uh, you know, the bollards no more than six meters apart, warning signs, uh, and just making it practical. The reason for those dimensions, they exist from the previous 2008 uh, code of practice, which was influenced by lots of people input into it. And we saw no reason in the 2019 version uh, to change them. Uh, and once they're robust and visual, I suppose that's achieving the objective of defining and delineating, if you like, the area of the electricity network that's defined within the hazard zone into which you're saying, by definition, you don't need to go up uh, to work. And obviously that doesn't apply every day of the construction, but you, 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 you stage it so that that's, that's, that's the relevant zone for the particular set of activities that you're dealing with on a particular day or a particular part of the day. So, and the next, if you like, scenarios where you're not still not carrying out any work so you're essentially for most of the time passing by the network but on these occasions you have to pass underneath the network to get from one part of the site to the other and there happens to be an overhead electricity line on the site which invariably there will be it may be that that overhead electricity line is going to be subsequently diverted or undergrounded as part of the development but often you know things don't happen uh, the way ideally they possibly should uh, and you're left with an existing hazard and when the hazard is there the responsibility is on the client and on the designer and the PSCS contractors etc to manage those risks and that's what the code of practice is fundamentally about in its detail and obviously we're not covering much of that detail this afternoon but it's there and that's why it's so important to read it and again as Mark has said it is readable it's not complex I don't think and by consulting with ESB I think you can take any possible complexity out of it by discussion. So, so you can see there, we, you're familiar with the, the crossing point and they're everywhere, you know, the red, the red ducting uh, securely held in barrels or whatever way it's securely held. And the maximum height there, you know, 4.2 is, is the maximum height and it's there for a reason. It can be higher by agreement with ESB. And the purpose of that is because you're crossing underneath an electricity line. And even last summer, there were lots of issues, particularly with the higher voltage lines where the network sagged because of the ambient temperature being so high and the electricity current flowing through the wires. You can imagine it's held at both points, whether that's a tower or a mast or a wooden pole. So once metal expands, as you're very familiar with yourselves, you know, it has to lengthen. And of course, if it's lengthened and it's held at two points, at the remote ends is going to sag in the middle. And so that's why the 4.2 is, is, is there. It's the maximum height given, if you like, that there's a, mac, uh, a maximum height that we can achieve over ground. Uh, so that you maintain that three meters of an exclusion zone. So that's why it's 4.2 and I suppose the maximum width is to make sure that um, you know it's, it's not a free-for-all. Obviously if you have to have a barrier or a restriction, a height restricting barrier, it has to be, I suppose, it has to by definition fulfill its purpose which is to restrict movement. And the whole idea of that is if you're, if you're using machinery and it's elevated across the site and you come to this point, you have no choice but to ensure that you, rate, you lower it and obviously you keep it lowered until you pass outside the other side of the hazard zone and then you're free to raise it. And just to amplify that by example, and sadly there have been at least two fatalities in my personal experience where it's like a raised machine or a raised tipper truck was the cause of fatality because the tipper wasn't lowered in time when it was crossing near the electricity line and it, was, it should have been a construction site but it wasn't treated as such and there was no height restricting barriers. And in hindsight, all of these things would have materially affected the outcome. So if you like, that's the second one. And then finally, which is the, I suppose, the situation that applies in most cases um, uh, where you're inside the hazard zone and that doesn't give anybody permission to be closer than the exclusion zone. And that's why, if you like, the words are up there, I suppose, in, in, in bright and bold red, is you have to ensure through your risk assessment RAM, RAM statements uh, and the control you have on site and the supervision that comes with that, uh, that the, the work can never reach the exclusion zone. And, and obviously, before the work begins, in all cases, as I said earlier, you have to verify the voltage by contacting ESB networks uh, so that you can in turn then, referring to the code of practice, identify what the hazard zone is and what the exclusion zone is. And even if you're outside the hazard zone and it's, your common sense tells you that you're never going to be inside the hazard zone because it's a very simple, quick, easy job, that doesn't remove the responsibility to identify the hazard zone and the exclusion zone and to note those in if you like your, your safety control documentation, RAMs and others. Um, and then obviously to make sure that you have that site specific risk assessment. And in my experience and in ESB's experience in general, like people and you know, lots of situations I've come across where uh, the risk assessment is, is quite generic in its nature. Um, and that's not the requirement. The requirement, as you know yourselves probably, is that it has to be site specific and relevant to the work. Uh, 
and indeed re re relevant to the equipment and the people that are actually operating and working on that particular site at that particular time. And that could change obviously from one day to another. It could be a new contractor that's coming in who needs extra special, if you like, care versus somebody who you, you may consider to be more competent. So ultimately it is about the competency of the people and your assessment of their competence. Um, so, so while I'm saying on top there, uh, you know, work must never breach the exclusion zone. And then you'll see I'm saying, well, where does the possibility of breaching the exclusion zone? And they are not contradictory uh, in my clear view. Uh, what you're recognizing in the second set of situations is that uh, I'm putting into controls, but I'm recognizing that there's a possibility that's greater than normal because maybe I'm changing air conditioning units on top of an existing building and I'm, I'm closer than I would like to be, but I have no physical option because the building is the height it is and the line is the height it is and why we would ideally like to switch out network the reality is in most cases particularly with the high voltage network and from a security supply point of view uh, it's not just possible and that's not if you like short changing safety it's recognizing the, the feasibility uh, or the lack of a feasibility of disconnecting the network in because disconnecting network can put other people at risk and, and compromise safety elsewhere hospitals and the like and it's entirely feasible and possible to do with our involvement and often we get involved in these more complex situations working with the, with the, con with the contractor or the client or the designer to, to ensure that the controls that are necessary in these extreme but hopefully rare occasions that where you know, there's a possibility, however remote, of breaching the exclusion zone in some way or form that you're setting out then in a very rigorous way to ensure that you've done everything reasonably practical in the circumstances as the legislation requires that you're not anticipating that it would happen in practice. Uh, and some of those things, you know, means that you have to consult the ESP networks that goes without saying, hopefully now I've said it often enough this afternoon without boring you, uh, that you have a very comprehensive and site-specific safe, safe system to work. And obviously that's required in all situations, but by way of emphasis in this particular high-risk, uh, extremely rare, hopefully, uh, situations. And then you have, you know, your meta statements and risk assessments, but fundamentally you've augmented them with a permit to work system, which is really saying that, you know, you have an extra level of control, uh, no more than with a hot work uh, permit, that you have a permit to work to deal with the situation where you're working uh, uh, in the vicinity of the exclusion zone, planning and not breaching it, but recognizing the slight possibility that it could be breached. Um, and some of the other controls that are called up in the Code of Practice in Chapter 7 in particular, you know, the use of certified limiters and, uh, and part of the, the, the competent dedicated observer and that's not anybody coming in that's a, a defined dedicated observer who must be competent for the task that you're assigning them or is are uh, mentioning or referencing them in, in the RAM statement so that's I suppose the fundamental issue of the code of practice and um, like the information is there fundamentally in the code of practice and I'd re-emphasize the importance of reading it downloading it um, and, and contacting us as you're required to do uh, in the interest of everybody's safety uh, where we can work with you and identify the difficult situations and, and come to you know a safe methodology for working that's that's in compliance with the code of practice and again as Marcus said it is a HSA code of practice which means you know that's an important document to 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 be to be complied with and in general if you like all that information that that we have is available on our own website esbnetworks.ie and um, uh, as well as the particular uh, service we provide in relation to uh, getting that voltage information to allow you to identify the hazard and exclusion zones and indeed get the map records and some people have a systematic approach of getting that every three months and it's updated automatically by ESP networks. Other people ring up as required and they are important if you like sources of information and uh, for you to ensure that you can always comply with the code of practice and the information is on, is on the screen there, dig at ESP.ie and then the 1850 928 number. And I suppose if you like trumping all of that in the generalities of, of, of all situations where you see something that you're, you're not happy with, you have a concern about the electricity network or you're not sure, the emergency number, which is our 24 7, 365 day uh, uh, emergency number, 1850 372 999, is, is the one that we encourage the public, contractors, farmers, everybody to, to contact with, with us. If they see something they're, not, they're concerned about, for example, to see a fallen wire, because often the action of uh, a person like that can actually materially improve the safety of somebody else. So it's always important that the contact is made as quickly as possible and as, as immediately as possible. And as well as that, as I'm saying on the website, we've a number of videos, we say, which are particular construction. There's one particular one, which if you like, is a, is a, 
I suppose, a summary of the main principles of the code of practice, which we've covered this afternoon, but it's a five minute video. And obviously we have the more detailed video, which features in the Safe Pass training program, which we've recently updated as well. Uh, and as I said, the website is there, esbnetworks.ie. And there's information there for all, I suppose, sectors in the community, the public, farmers, construction, everybody. Uh, and while that information uh, is there, we're constantly seeking to update it and make it relevant at all times. So I suppose that's a whistle stop kind of tour through maybe some of the fundamentals of the code of practice, the exclusion zone and the hazard zone in particular. And the bottom line, I suppose, as we're saying is, if you can at all, keep a safe distance away from electricity wires always. So there's a question here which is asking why is it taking so long? It can be something, you know, months, three to six months to get ESB to address issues with services through uh, construction sites where they need to be isolated, cut off or diverted. So I, I don't know the particular detail, but having worked in the field a number for a number of years, um, like our objective is always to deal with, if you like, issues and hazards as quickly as we can. For example, with an emergency, we respond immediately to that. Um, so, but in the sense of the question and taking the question as it is like uh, if that's an issue it's it's an issue that we have to get better at and uh, uh, and i don't have an answer for the particular question other than to say the, the sooner we can work with the build, builder and get the hazard off the site on the basis of the principle of prevention which is to eliminate the hazard that's what we're seeking to do now if if we're not achieving that well then that's something we 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 have to work with as well uh, with if you like, the developer, the designer, and, and not to excuse it at all, I'm taking the question fully at face value and saying we've work to do to make that better. But the other side of it is with the best will in the world, sometimes there are delays. Uh, it's, it's difficult to get a line switched out sometimes. Uh, sometimes we don't hear about it uh, because it's not flagged there enough. And that's why the code of practice in the design state, the design section of it would, I suppose, draw attention to the, to the value in, in contacting ESB networks very quickly uh, once, if you like, there's any sense of, of a project going ahead. And I'm not saying that to excuse anything on our part, but th the more we can work together and the earlier we're aware of the scope of a project, um, the quicker we can respond. Um, so I, I hope that, if you like, uh, elucidates maybe some of the reasoning for it without suggesting an excuse. Yeah. Again, just to, to re-emphasize what Erica has said there, <clears throat> as early as possible, um, PSDP particularly, should be getting ESB involved with the, the design, the on-site planning, to ensure that when the time comes for the construction activity to ramp up in terms of the PSCS and contractors on site, that ESB has already been on, on site. We have done the necessary sort of calculations in terms of how we're going to move the line, how the line is going to be um, de-energized, how the businesses at the far end of that network have to be uh, backfed, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of different variables involved in that. So again, I would just emphasize, as Arthur has done, get an ESB as actively in, as involved, as quickly as involved at the earliest possible opportunity in a project, which ultimately will bear fruit later on in the project where you won't have those three to six month delays as been, as been um, put down by the, 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 the person from the, with the question. Um, there's a second one there. Is there a list available of local ESB contacts in each region slash county to liaise with in advance of starting a project, e.g. a pipeline, to walk the route? So yes, there is. Um, there are um, area managers in all of the different uh, regions. There's also um, a number of safety personnel who are specifically involved in talking and addressing these types of challenges with um, third parties, be they members of the public or be they with um, clients, uh, PSDPs, etc. So you can get some of those um, level or those names are on our website. Or alternatively, if you call in through the contact center, they redirect you to the local contact person. Um, bear in mind, this, there's, there's 3,000 plus people uh, employed within the ESB networks business. So there's, there's lots of different movement and there's lots of different um, engagement and, and sort of movement around in the regions. So sometimes it's better to come in through the contact center and the contact center redirect the, the query to the relevant area manager who then will direct it to either the safety rep, the safety champion, the local SDSS or a supervisor or indeed just one of our network technicians who can come on site and who can, who can walk uh, through the, the parameters of the, the query or the project with um, the right people. And just to amplify that a little bit, you know, and obviously uh, like we can learn from the question coming in here and the response and, and there's probably some things we can do to improve. 
if you like, the, the relevance and the currency of our own website in terms of the contactability of key people in throughout the country because we have all of those and like the yellow van and the contactability of ESB networks people with the public is a very important part of our philosophy and values. But also what we, as Mark has said, like that, that 1-8-50-372-757, which is the general queries number, or indeed the emergency number, which is the 999 number, in either and all of those cases, once that call is, is brought in, it's, it's linked straight away to the relevant location based on where you are, and that's where you have an NPRN number or indeed an address, and of course it's trackable then from our point of view. So I suppose just to reassure the, the questioner, you know, once that comes in, it's, it's absolutely traceable and tracked in our system yep. uh, so that, you know, it's, it, it's probably is the most efficient way to establish a contact. And the best example I can use of that and going back to the earlier question about design and stuff like that is when people apply for a supply for, for a new house or an apartment or whatever it might be, you know, that's the process that works. And once that, once you kick that off, as Mark said, at the earliest possible time, it's trackable and traceable from there on. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 the, it's the ideal way to, to contact DSB. But, but as well as that, I think we can look at improving, you know, the availability of information on the website. So thanks for the question. Um, there's one more question after arriving in. Do machines working under, underneath overhead lines have to have a height restrictor installed on them? Um, so, so yeah, the, contained within code, um, we do call out for a number of controls to ensure people don't get into the relevant zones. Um, and one of those controls is a height restrictor. So any piece of equipment where there is the possibility of putting a restrictor or a, a limiter on it, be that a crane, be that a mobile crane, be that um, an excavator, or any of those types of equipment, yes, we do look to make sure that there's a restrictor put in them. Again, a, and a restrictor is a very particular type of mechanical control which limits the slew of the crane or the, the raising of the excavator arm to ensure that you don't get into those um, exclusion, that exclusion zone. Um, and again, it's a very particular control, which is only one part of a number of other controls which you should have outlined in your, your method statements, procedures, documented systems of work, or whatever you like to call them. What confidence, training, experience and knowledge is required by the dedicated observer? So, so again, that, like the question is what competency, training, experience, and knowledge with the definition of competency is required by the dedicated observer? And like, that, thanks for the question. And like, it's covered very clearly in the code of practice, uh, that requirement, and it's not a big treatment in the code of practice because it's, it's a definition of competency, and that's really up to the person who's employing them or engaging them to make sure that they're happy that they're competent for the task that they're being asked to undertake. And I feel like that's been tested in various court cases and legislation as defined in the HSAs if you like, uh, uh, documentation, 2005 Act and all of that. Was, so like in, in practical terms, what it means is, is somebody, firstly, it has to be a part of your system of work so that the people that they're observing understand the role of the dedicated observer. The dedicated observer fundamentally understands their own role, which is, if you like, firstly, the, the implications of the code of practice and the implications of the hazard that electricity can present. And secondly, then the practical requirements of understanding how they're going to communicate and the code of practice speaks to that in terms of you know two-way radio communication and agreed system of hand signaling and all of that and while you know behind the question possibly is uh, there isn't a, a, if you like a training course that i'm aware of that people can go on and be certified as dedicated observers at the same time the code of practice does amplify the basic requirements which is i suppose the competency and i suppose the integrity uh, and I suppose the visual acuity to be able to recognize when something is about to happen before it does happen because often when things have gone wrong it's a miscommunication or a failure for one person to see the other person's signals or I thought you were signaling left when it was meant to be right so it's those kind of things and I'd say part of that is is, is practice at a low level because again when you're testing limiters and stuff you can test them in the ground to make sure that they only go high the wrong time to test them and to find out that they're not working is when you expect them to work underneath a, light, a high a high voltage line so those things can be built into part of your if you like on-site jssp or toolbox talks that frequently and regularly that you you test those equipments and make sure particularly if you're doing critical work that you've pre-tested all of those procedures and if you like pre-tested the people that you have uh, fulfilling those safety critical roles including dedicated observer. I think this question, this next question has come in, it's, limit, it's related. Is, is there such training available in the industry currently, e.g. recommended content? 
Um, to the best of my knowledge, there isn't um, in that um, the, the, the competency requirement is really up to the employer to define and then ultimately to implement. So that could be on-site training, that could be relevant local training, or indeed you could uh, state that you want somebody to be competent up to and including having a ticket, a banksman ticket, for example. So again, there's, there's, the, we don't specify in the code of practice the level of competency or competence required to fulfill that role. Um, but it is, is something that is very much at the behest or in the control of uh, the employer um, and ultimately then obviously implementable by the PSCS on site. So from that perspective, no, there isn't. Um, there's just one more question has come in. Um, if you are working around slash close to ESB poles, do you have to, do you have a certain area around them closed off? If yes, how many meters? Yeah, well, like really, I suppose, again, that question is, is very relevant to what we've just talked about. We've tended to talk about, if you like, the vertical dimension looking up at the overhead electricity wires, which is where the source is, but the pole or the structure, the mast or the tower that's supporting the network is as critical, if you like, to the, to the safety of the network and ultimately then to the safety of people, any people in the vicinity of that network, whether that's directly in the vicinity or remotely in a remote from that particular part of the network. So like the same requirements or the same criteria apply. So the answer to that question is if that's a low voltage, medium voltage, 10,000, 20,000 and up to 38,000, that safe distance is three meters from any part of the electricity network that's there, whether that's a stay or particularly the pole. And the reason for that is just to explain it, because I think when people understand what's going on underground, you, you understand the significance of the requirement. There can be earth wires attached to the pole which fulfill a very important safety function in the event of a fault uh, and they, they run directly away from the pole a distance of sometimes four to five meters and uh, they're buried in the ground but at the same time undermining a pole foundation or undermining a mass foundation is a very critical thing to avoid ever happening and that's why keeping the safe distance from if you like the pole and ideally it's the hazard zone distance so in that case it's either six or ten meters is the ideal zone and sometimes this arises where there's site works going on and people want to complete the site works as, as, as well and as tidily as possible. And the electricity pole, which maybe is going to be diverted, is, is maybe the last thing to be considered. And sometimes poles have been undermined and we've had to return. Uh, and with the code of practice, I suppose, recognised that there was a breach of the code of practice and ultimately serve a stop work notification, which is, a, I suppose, an element of the control that ESB Networks has in the interest of everybody's public safety, where we feel there's a breach of the code of practice in the short term. Um, that we serve a stop work notification, which is a restriction on the work going ahead, essentially stopping the work. That, that's communicated to the HSA directly. And you know that brings, I suppose, its own level of scrutiny then as well. But it's all, I suppose, based on, if you like, the emphasis and priority that everybody attaches to public safety and particular safety in relation to the electricity network. So I hope that's answered the question. It's absolutely three meters and ideally it's outside the hazard zone. And that's why it, if, if there's a requirement to go closer, the contact should be made with ESB to establish, you know, is there any flexibility in terms of what can happen uh, in that particular situation. But ideally, you don't want to be undermining the pole foundation because, and particularly the stays that attach to the pole, which are equally important because that retain, they retain the tension in the overhead network, which in turn makes sure that the height over ground is retained so that the exclusion zone three metres remains relevant. Okay, thank you, Arthur. Um, just the last one that has quickly just come in there is, can you run through a brief summary of the one meter zone in specific scenarios, um, a reduction from the three? Yep, so just again, looking at the code of practice, that's uh, section nine contained within the code of practice, which is associated with road strengthening and resurfacing works. Look, ultimately we do recognize that in some urban environments, um, it's not possible to, to implement the three meter zone. Um, so in very specific circumstances um, where uh, due to the urban um, nature of the work and also to the fact that it's, it's very specifically related to um, the, the construction, um, that there is a, the possibility of the, uh, a one metre uh, zone, being uh, exclusion zone being implemented around the overhead lines. Um, this again is just... Um, taken into account everyday scenarios in terms of urban environments. That's where, you know, you just physically do not have the three meters. Um, and that could, that would be including up to and including shops, um, fronts, um, lean tools, all that kind of thing. So the code of practice does take into account. Um, it was in the 2008 code and it was retained in the 2019 code. 
that's very specific requirement around the one meter uh, exclusion uh, zone being implemented for a very specific very specific type of construction activity. Do you want to say anything? Like and, that? And, and, and in particular, it's, it's referenced in chapter nine, which is, if, if you like, in relation to road strengthening works rather than pure construction work. So yeah. it recognizes the reality of your, your resurfacing or doing some work with an existing road structure. Doesn't that, that concession does not, or that restriction or relaxation of the three meters, that back to one meter for fair low voltage network. Uh, doesn't apply to construction work and I'd refer the questioner again to the earlier part the definition of the exclusion zone which I said typically is three meters because that's for bare low voltage and up to 10, 20,000 and 38 and it is one meter for for insulated LV provided the insulated LV is verified by ESV because insulation is only as good as the insulation is on it it gets damaged over time can be damaged accidentally and in which case you have to treat the network as bare so like so the three meter fundamental thing for bare network still applies but as mark has said it recognizes the reality in those situations where you're strengthening or resurfacing existing roads the practicality are such that you know the work couldn't go ahead but if you ask me as you know the three meters is still the desirable outcome if you can if you can achieve that sometimes you can't and with that i'll say thank you very much Thank you. Thanks very much for Mark Barn. Yeah, thank you. And uh, on behalf of the CIF, um, let me thank um, Mark and Arthur for, uh, for coming in today. Thanks again for uh, your participation um, and uh, thanks again to ESP Networks.